what we want to do is we want to soak our brushes in water before we get ready to paint. So, you know, first thing you do, fill up your basin with fresh water, cold water, and put your brushes in the brush rest. And that way they'll be waking up. You know, brushes are very much like you in the morning. You've got to splash some water on your face, brush your teeth, and you feel better. You're awake. Same thing for a brush. Do this is um, because actually a chemistry. Bill Nye the Science Guy is a show that I watch with my kids and he had this feature on one day that talked about water molecules are attracted to water molecules. Very much like um, when you have a sponge in the kitchen and you're trying to mop up some spill, a dry sponge doesn't soak up as much as a wet sponge does. Same thing with your brush. A wet brush will float prettier, will, make, will be more controlled than a dry brush. So you want to soak your brush. Okay, so we've wet our brush. Next step we have to do is we have to dry our brush. We're just going to fold it up in the paper towel with the direction of the bristles and we're going to pinch out all the water. This is the ferrule of the brush and when your brush is soaking in the water, the water soaks underneath the ferrule and wicks up the, up the bristles that are tucked up under there. So we want to pinch out everything and suck it kind of back out so that we know what we're starting with. We have a nice controlled dry brush, no wet handle to slip around. Step three is load water. We're going to take our brush and we're going to dip it halfway into the clean side of our water. This is the brush, this is the side of the basin that we clean our brush in, and this is the side where the water stays clean. If this water on this side gets dirty, I want you to take a break, take your bristles, your brushes out, and go get some clean water or some fresh water. What we're going to do is we're going to dip our brush halfway up the, up the bristles. Okay, no more than halfway. If you go up to the ferrule, it's going to wick under there and you're going to have surprises later. That's bad. So we dip our brush straight in to the side of the, straight into the water, in the clean water. And now we have loaded water. Step four is we're going to touch the paper towel. This is where our wet spot on our paper towel comes in. I don't know if you can see the shine, but if you have a lot of water in your brush, then your brush is going to be shiny. A way to tell when you're done touching the paper towel is by the shine. I just gently touch. Notice that my bristles don't, if I'm pressing too hard, my bristles are going to splay out. That's too hard. We don't want to do that. So I'm going to load more water. I've got a shine going on. And I'm going to touch the paper towel. Just gently rest it there. I can even let go of my hand. And that's how gentle I'm touching. Okay, so touch, and because that's a wet spot on the paper towel, water is attracted to water, it's going to wick out just the right amount of water from your brush. Step five is load the paint. The way we're going to load the paint is we're going to have our brush back at an angle. If we load our paint at a straight upward angle, we're not going to have control. So we lean it back on an angle, and we hi-ya, karate chop, purr! just into the corner of the paint. We don't want any more than, you don't even want to be halfway across for this load. And we don't want to be more than halfway up the brush. If you've got too much paint on your brush, then you need to rinse your brush out and you need to start over. Step six is blend, blend, blend. We're going to push on our brush. We're going to set it down on the flat of its brush. We're not going to be at an angle this way or at an angle this way. We're right on the flat and we're fairly upright, not completely because then you'll stab down on your bristles. But we're almost upright. Got a little bit too much water, gonna blot that off. Blend, blend, blend. And I just keep blending like this until I start seeing that there's a graduation in the color on my bristles. Sometimes it takes five or six times. I usually say about five to seven times to blend. Okay, as long as this side stays clean, then we're good to go to the next step. Step seven is the whole point of the exercise. Apply it to your project. So here we go. We're going to set the brush down flat and we're not going to use any pressure at all this time. So just gentle resting it on there. A pretty float is going to start off dark with a very nice chiseled edge and it's going to go fade. Float right across the water part of your brush to disappear on the far side. Okay, seven steps can be a lot of work if you're floating, you know, if you have a project that's float, 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 
That can be a lot of work and it can be kind of irritating to go through all seven steps every time you need more paint. So I'm going to show you a shortcut. <clears throat> you load your water, your paint, your brush is already dried out because every time you take it out of the water you dry it. You load your water, touch a paper towel, karate chop into your paint, blend, blend, blend. Every now and again I throw a backwards blend in it just to kind of use up the paint in the brush. Apply your float. Okay, that's all great and fine and dandy, but Squirt a little water drops onto your palette and when you run out of water you can just pick up because the water molecules are attracted you can pick up a few water drops come back to your same spot blend some more reapply now watch I'm not even going to load any more paint at all I'm not touching my paper towel okay this is a shortcut this is for when you conquer floating and now you want to move quicker I love Um, and I'm going to use names specifically because I get a lot of questions from painters that say, you know, why can't I do my dry brushing like, and then they fill in the blank. Um, some names that come to mind, this kind of dry rubbing technique, which is done with a totally dry brush, um, is used by Rebecca Bear, Linda Locke, Debbie Cole, um, trying to think of a few more of those dry rubbers out there, um, maybe Arlene Beck, um, and let's see who else. Okay, anyway, those are the top names that come to my mind. They use a technique where they dip their brush into a little bit of paint, they rub it off on a paper towel, and then they just slowly just scumble it in, just rubbing very so softly. And the, the technique actually makes dust that you have to blow away. It's a dry brush with dry paint with a dry product on your um, palette. But it is, not, um, it is not what the other half of the industry is calling dry brushing. This to me, because you're rubbing, I have termed my own terminology to be a dry rub technique. So in my packets, when you hear dry rub, then you're going to be doing the totally dry technique that you rub with. And when you hear the dry brush, you're going to use the other technique. Which Okay, so some of these brushes, what these brushes all have in common, and I don't have Rebecca Bear's brush here, it's the Crescent brush. Um, but you've, um, Ronnie Bringle started years ago with this Lang Nickel brush, and it's got a red handle, and it has a little stiff little natural sable um, tip to it. Then um, she had the Bringle blender made for her, and you'll see this a lot, and it's very stiff. <clears throat> Let me zoom in just a little bit. My brushes are rolling away. Okay, and then um, different knockoff brushes. There's a number of manufacturers that make the same kind of brush that the Bringle Blender is made for. Um, the problem with these brushes, and it's not really a problem, um, if you like them, they're just the cat's meow, and I can actually float with these brushes. I mean, they're a really versatile tool, and I own a number of them. Um, and that's covered in the How to Float DVD. Anyway, um, the problem with these brushes is they're very, very expensive. If you're going to dry rub, then you need a number of brushes because your brush has to be totally dry. Okay, so then um, I came across this fabric scumbler, which um, Kim Hogue introduced me to. And it's very, very stiff, very, very cheap. My problem with this one's a little bit too stiff. And then, voila, one day I found um, Royal makes a stencil brush. And they're very stiff, but it's a natural fiber instead of um, this brush, which has got a synthetic fiber. The natural fiber allows it to be a little bit softer and blend a little bit better. And these at just a few dollars a piece are quite a deal. And you can afford to own a number of them and without breaking the bank. Okay, they come in a crescent shape that's um, narrow at the top and wide here, and it's cut in an oval tip. And then a really large size. I love the large size for backgrounds. Okay, the backgrounds um, in the dried hydrangeas, in the background you'll see some glazing. Well, instead of glazing, you can just dip your brush in and rub it into the background. And, you know, it just, it's easy to use. And then um, the round shaped ones are actually a stencil brush that <clears throat> has this dome tip to it. And that makes, you can see mine is stained. They get stained after you get them in color the first couple times. Um, that's okay, they're still just as soft as they need to be. 
anyway, the um, the dome shape allows you to shade um, or highlight in the center of fruit, and you know just in your round areas and make a really nice rounded technique. The fat handles make them really nice to hang on to. And no, this isn't a sales pitch, but these are really amazing, and I just want you to know about them because uh, they're they're affordable, which makes it just bonus for all of us. And you can own them in all tons of sizes, and nobody else, none of these guys, come in a size as large as this for my backgrounds, which I love busy, kind of um, fun backgrounds. And I'll show you, I'm going to show you on the pair that I did and the how to float, um, how to actually walk through using them. Um, you know when you have a piece of, when you have a project like this um, leaf, and you've got these tints and glazings of color on the inside, this leaf is actually based in this gold color. And then I've just rubbed on little hints here and there. Get a clean brush, a little bit of brown, a little bit of red. And you just dust it on. There's zero skill involved. And I, I like to joke when I'm teaching my classes that watch me, I can paint with my eyes shut and just close my eyes and I can just keep rubbing and, and it doesn't hurt anything to keep rubbing. And it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. I love to do this technique, this dry rub. And in this little dough bowl here, let's see if I can get that centered. These little itty bitty tiny leaves. That's when you're going to want to switch to, like the Lang Nickel or the Dome Rounds or um, Rebecca Bear makes a tiny tiny little crescent one. Um, and then you just dee -dee 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 -dee, do a little. That's my Minnie Mouse scumbling right there. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Get in there and then just little hints of color and presto changeo, they're all done. So really tiny brush for really tiny areas, but in the case of this really big area or on the pair I'm going to show you in a little bit, a bigger brush, even, 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 here's, here's the one that I love for my background and you know compared to my fingers you can see how big this must be. If you just tip the very center of it, wipe it off on a paper towel, I can even use these great big brushes to do this. Okay, And if you had like this darker area in here, instead of doing the slip slap technique that I call, you could just go ahead and rub in some color. It also makes excellent um, for antiquing and stuff, these brushes do. So now that I've showed you a few examples, I'm going to show you um, the basics of dry rubbing. And, um, and hopefully that will clear up some of the confusion that we have. Oh, and I have chunky paint it sounds like. Get out some paint. Okay, so we're going to start with the dry palette. You do not want a wet palette in this case. We're going to start with a flat, dry paper towel. And we're going to start with a dry brush. Any, any wet in this, and it ends up being a glaze technique. And we don't want to glaze this. We want to dry rub it. So we're going to tip our dry brush in our dry paint. Okay, you can see that that's just tipped in the middle. And I'm not scooping it up. Okay, and then we're going to rub on our paper towel. I learned this technique the first time um, from Linda Locke. This is how she does it, and we went through, oh my mercy, we went through paper towels. Okay, rub, 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 I'm shaking the whole table. When you're sitting next to somebody in a class and you feel it time to do a dry rub technique, make sure you check to make sure that they're not lining their face or something. Um, I've been in so many classes where people start like, earthquake, and the person next to them is doing detail work. So always be careful when you're going to shake the table. Anyway, you want to dry this off until there's almost no paint left. Notice how dark that is and how light that is. Then you're going to go to your project. Now what you need on, in this case, with dry brushing, you needed a project that had even tooth. With this, you need a project that has even smoothness. You can see where there's some real differences in the type of, of painting. One, if you have any tooth, you're going to screw up, and the other, if you have no tooth, you're going to screw up. So um, it's real important. Dry rub has no, you have a smooth surface. Dry brush, you have tooth that's even on your surface. I'm going to pretend like this is an apple. I think we're going to pretend it's a circle. Anyway, wherever you want this color to be the darkest is where you're going to put your brush down first. And I'll show you an example out here. If I put my brush down here, you know what, I just got like powder. Put a little bit more paint in there. If it turns to powder, you know you've waited too long. <clears throat> I'm going to start where I want it to be the darkest. 
and with the gentlest pressure. Okay, so it's almost like tiptoeing in. Just want to go gently at first, and you just rub in a shape following motion. Okay, so you can see that's dark. And as we get to the outside, we'll use still light pressure, but you'll see it gets lighter and lighter. We don't want, if we wanted to have a shadow right in the middle, and it will raise dust and you just wipe that away. If we wanted a shadow to be right in the middle, we would want it to be darkest in the center. Okay, so, okay, so set it down where you want it to be the darkest. And slowly just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Notice the angle of my brush straight up and down. Brush away the dust. Sometimes you'll find it necessary to um, set this with a blow dryer before um, proceeding. So I'm going to go back into my paint, rub off. I'm not going to rub very long though. I want to show you, um, this is what it will look like when you've screwed it up or when you haven't spent enough time on the paper towel. Okay, you're going to find that it comes off really, really dark. Just go ahead, you can generally just lift that right back off with a paper towel or um, a wet brush or something like that, but let it dry before you move on and try dry brushing, it, dry rubbing again. Spend more time on the paper towel till it almost disappears. Switch to a clean part. And see how much softer that comes off when this is too, 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 too strong. Now I'll come over here, pretend like I want to add shadow over here in the corner. I'm just going to start in the darkest, which is right next to the apple, edge of the apple. And then I'm just going to walk out so it fades away. <clears throat> okay, and it makes just a really pretty graduated, grad graduated shadows. Okay, and I'm going to show you more with the pair with this. Another example that I want to show you this one is one of my favorites. I think we've all painted one of those giant bows around a bentwood box with the big giant ribbon. Um, and then you get in this ribbon and they say to do this flip float, which is where you know you have your paint loaded here and you put it here and you flip it over. And then you get out your mop and you're mopping, mopping, mopping. And then you end up with a big ridge line right in the middle. Um, one of my least favorite ways to float. I can do it. I'm not afraid of it, but I don't like doing it. Um, there's a lot of easier ways to paint than that. So if you're going to float or highlight right in the middle, load more paint on my brush. Doesn't matter what color. <clears throat> dry it off. So see if you can load paint in the middle of your brush and dry it off on a paper towel. You can do this project or this technique. Okay. So pretend like we need that highlight. And this is a dark color, but I'm on white paper, so use your imagination. Um, just gently where we want it to be the strongest color, we would start rubbing in the shape that we wanted the highlight to be. And we would get that, you know, a little bit strong. And then just gently walk out to either side. And then build it up in the center, but with a little bit more pressure. And a little bit more pressure. Okay, so you can see how that was much easier than flip floating. And the same thing would go on a big area like this. If you had a great big, um, you know, ribbon or like these leaves or like that, and you needed a highlight right up, you know, in this main area, I'm just going to take it, rub it in the shape that you want it to follow. If you're seeing dust, it's a good thing. Okay, so you can see how pretty that would look. And then if you need it a little bit darker or a little bit stronger, after it's dry, or go ahead and hit it with a blow dryer, then you just repeat the step. And I can show you right here, we'll repeat that with the same color. You can use a different color if you want to deepen it. Okay, so we just want to just repeat that right there. Get it a little bit stronger. Okay, so you can see how that's deeper. And we can do the same thing at the center of our highlight here. Just a little bit more.
So what's different about the brush that I do use for dry brushing? I must have an uneven floor because all my brushes are rolling towards the front here. <clears throat> okay, I use what I call Patty's Favorite Dry Brush and it is actually a royal brush that is a filbert brush and it makes pretty decent leaves and um, floral strokes. I use it for my petals and all that kind of stuff as well, but I love it for dry brushing. In an oval like a cat's tongue, and when you turn it on its side, it's cut where the end is like shaved, okay? So the point at the top is very, very thin, and it's very thick back here. What that's going to do for us is it's going to allow little tiny scratches of paint to be applied to our surface, which is what the layering um, technique of dry brushing is going to do. But it's very important that you have a stiff brush to do this with, um, and it's got to be a filbert. You can also use a round and some other things, but let's talk about um, how to load our brush, our dry brush. Okay, I have my filbert brush that I'm going to dry brush with, my favorite dry brush. And um, the way that most of the people, Bobby Takashima, Joe Sonia, Vicki Rhodes, um, Rosemary West is who I learned this from, so I can honestly say I know that this is how she does it. Um, they sequence paint. So you're going to start with your darkest color, which is your back, black background. And then you're going to move forward in the sequence and gradually highlight and get lighter and lighter, like I showed you on the pumpkin. Um, picture. Now my black color I'm not really going to load into my paint. I'm going to use my next, it's, so I'm going up values. Just minute values to the final highlight. Might even have a little white on that. Um, so we don't jump. And what we're also going to do is we're going to bring each of these colors down and in between each of them we're going to create another value. So our value jump is going to be actually really low. And this layered look um, is going to give us our depth. I've had a lot of my dry brush pieces um, accused of being oil paintings, which there's no blending or work or anything involved in this. So it's the layering look that um, achieves that nice um, oil painted quality. And I think it must keep the colors brighter too because there's more paint on the piece. You need a paper towel and you need a paper towel that is folded flat. Okay, and the reason the reason for this is, is you need to be able to skim your brush off on your paper towel and if you have a paper towel that's in a bunch like this, you're going to catch way too much on the highs and lows. You're not going to have an even playing field so you need a flat paper towel and a dry one is good. Um, wet will just add water into the mix and create other problems. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my brush and I'm actually going to wash my brush out, okay, which I'm using just a brush basin. Now I have water in my brush, but I'm going to go ahead and just pinch out the water. I'm not worried about drying it out. We don't rub it on the paper towel or anything. We just want most of the water, you know, sort of dry. Um, then we're going to reach into our paint. Let me see if I can telephoto this. Okay, that's good. We're going to reach forward into the paint and drag some paint out. We're not going to go into the center of the paint and pull out. Just going to reach forward and scoop it up on the bottom. Now watch what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to move the angle of the brush, the camera. I'm going to reach in and I want you to notice that my brush presses down into this paint and I'm pressing completely down on the ferrule. Notice how far down my ferrule is. I'm going to work this paint into my bristles back and forth. I'm just working the first load of this is the most important because from there we just keep adding paint. Now an interesting thing is going to start happening and I'm sure right. Notice that this is the top of my brush and notice how much, see that big ridge right there? Notice how much paint is on the top. It's a big glommy glom. That's the top, now here comes the bottom. There is no ridge of paint on the bottom. It is all on the top. So as we're pushing that paint into our brush, we are creating a great big glommy ridge on the top of our bristles and I'm pressing, I mean I'm almost pound, 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 pound 
Okay, that first load is really important. You're working the paint into the brush. And you might be asking yourself, oh, you know, this is just um, wrecking my brush. But, you know, once again, that's the point I was making about having a $5 paintbrush. Okay, I like this load a lot. This load is even all the way over the top. It has an even ridge of paint. It, my bristles are splayed out. Can you see there's almost a little serrated knife action going on the tips? <clears throat> it's no longer smooth. There is no paint on the bottom. Well, there is paint, but you know what I mean. Okay, and the top is shiny, gooey, glommy. <clears throat> okay, so we've loaded our first color. I'm going to go onto a white surface so you can see what this is going to look like. Here, I'll find you. So now that I've done this, now I've got to, it's been sitting here for a minute. Okay, now that I've done this, I'm just going to come onto my paper towel and I'm going to just flick off just a little. Notice how streaky scratchy that is. That's perfect. What this little step right here is going to do is it's going to prevent any really harsh line stop and starts when you come onto your surface. So you always have to make sure you come onto your paper towel and just do a little bit of a drag on there just to make sure you don't have any sudden surprises. Okay, so our first color is going to be this green color okay and that's what we're going to be looking for we just want streaky scratchy now when you're practicing this and you definitely get out a piece of paper this is um just like a sketchbook paper so it's got a little bit of a coarse action to it I don't want to see any of this stuff okay that's way too much pressure reload my brush just a little bit because I wiped a bunch off there flick on my paper towel okay what I want to see is this real feathery looking start and stops I don't want to see any, listen to me being all bossy, I don't want to see any harsh marks at the very beginning. And what I want you to practice doing is I want you to come just right next to each other and almost make, you know, almost like not a base coat, but see if you can't get a unified look across. Notice when I come up here, notice that the bristles aren't bending hardly at all. Okay, there is no pressure. If I press, that's what you're going to see. See the pressure on my bristles? See how they bend? That's going to give me like a base coat look. Okay, but I don't want that. So I want to come onto my piece and I just want to tickle it. The nice thing about this technique is you can keep at it for hours and hours and hours because it's just a very comfortable little movement of your hand just back and forth. Um, it's not something that's going to give you carpal tunnel because you're not doing the death grip on your on your utensil. Okay, let's talk about hand movements. Notice that my brush is um, in my hand at a slight angle. Notice the straight up and downness. I'm anchoring my hand with my pinky and my whatever this part of my hand is called, the palm of my hand or the the whatever heel of my hand. Okay, and I'm going to reach across and I'm just ever so lightly going to drag my bristles in a straight motion towards myself. Okay, I wanted to get it too stripey there, so I'll go back and make it a little bit more solid. I'm just tickling. Now, when I'm doing something that's in a circular motion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a little bit of a, almost a, um, a helicopter takeoff or an airplane takeoff and landing um, my husband's into airplanes and he was in the Air Force and they do touch and goes. What that's going to look like, so say you're doing pumpkins or something, you're going to come around, you're going to touch down, pick up, lift off in a graduated way, set back down, lift off, landing. Okay, then the center of, say, a pumpkin, you're going to have these little, you're going to leave space so that your background can show and that would be your first step of your dry brushing on a pumpkin in the appropriate colors, of course. Okay, so it's very important. Now notice, I don't know if you can see that, I'm getting a little bit of a lip on my brush. So now what it's time to do, and I'm seeing a few, because I'm talking and stopping the camera and stuff, I'm seeing a few little dried straggles. I still have plenty of paint, but what I'm going to do, sit down in the chair, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip my brush over to where that glommy paint is and that little, see that little lip there? That looks like a brush that's just going to get wrecked, but it won't because I'm going to flip it over. 
I'm going to load the other side. Move that paint to the other side and I'm going to start abusing the opposite side of my brush. So every now and again just flip it over and now I have paint, big wad of paint on the top. That's not really next to my bristles. Nothing on the back side. Go on to my paper towel and I'm ready to go again. And it's just a tickle. Tickle that surface. Romeo is one of the projects that I've done um, using the dry brush and I just wanted to show you this is my painted clock and he's varnished so I'm just going to paint on top. A lot of times what happens with um, people's projects I call these um, scales, they kind of look like little v-shaped scales to me but if you end up with too much of a dark area let me show you, and I don't have a color to fix it but I want to show you to fix this, we would just reverse it with the colors in the sequence. I'm just going to wipe it off. But sometimes you get too much of an area that has too much of a space in it between one side and the other. And if you look at it, to me, I call these bullet holes. Bullet holes. Okay, it looks like poor Romeo has been shot in the chest with some BB gun or something. So to avoid that, we want to close our colors up together and we would flick in a few extra scales or a few extra green um, breast feathers. Okay, so it, up here, a lot of times up in this area, now watch, I'm going to lick my finger and wipe that off. Thank goodness for varnish. Okay, up here in this area, notice that you know you have this dark area around the beak. This comes remarkably close to being just a little bit too dark. Too much too dark. And it, I don't think it quite crosses the line but it's really close. So if you felt you had that, I'm going to wipe my brush out. I'm going to pick up a little bit of opaque red because that's pretty close to the colors I used. I could close the gap up here with a little bit more red. I could just bring that up, close those gaps, and then that makes everybody look like they're happy and joining. Okay. If you get too close, you lose the shadow and the definition. Also, you can see I mixed a white in with this um, highlight color. That comes remarkably close, and I'm not saying I don't like it. It comes very close to being a little bit too pink. You could glaze that and make him much more red if you wanted his colors to improve or his colors to become more vibrant. Okay, and now we'll just dip our little cloth into some water and take it back out. But I wanted to give you a clue what you could do to correct some common mistakes. to separate these leaves and hoping that I can I want to get a bigger float though I'm not happy with the size of this little float so went back and loaded more paint as you get to the tip of the leaf you're going to want the float to get a little bit skinnier is your fingers to blot if we get everything separated then we'll be able to um, a, we'll be able to see where our leaves are. It'll clean up some of those chisel edges. It'll make us feel like we're not looking at a yellow mass, huh? This is good. Once again, leading with my chisel, I'm tucking the toe of my brush into those, um, oops, hit the line. And you can't, if you can't see around your brush, then you're going to have a hard time um, floating. So you need to make sure that you turn your project so that you can see um, where you're going. 
And then you don't want to go through your float when it's wet, so you have to let everything dry before you go dragging something else through it. If you notice, I'm not making beautiful floats, I'm just defining things. They're not too stripy though. If they're too stripy, then we're going to have a problem. Now what we want to do is we want to go back to where things are um, deeper. Okay, so that's going to be a wide, wide float. So what that means is maybe this leaf is further away and they're not like laying flat on top of each other. So I want to deepen the shading and make it wider in that area so like it's casting a bigger shadow but not all the way across. Okay, so now that one's laying a little bit further. We might want to deepen this area right here. Even like I said, give it that wash to close it up so that that is a recessed little area. Okay, now this is flipped up so this is going to be deeper. So, let's see, how are we doing? Maybe, here's another one. Let's get these rolled edges a little bit wider. Okay, so that's flipped up. Maybe over here. So it's like wide there and then skinny back to here. And this one could probably be the same kind of way. This will give us different dimensions, this one's. Notice I'm kind of pat blending. I'm not just. Um, is that because my name is Pat? No, no, no. Ho, 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 ho. Sorry. Um, I'm not um, blending all in one stroke. That makes it easier for me to pull my float out a little wider. Okay. I think this poor guy right here got missed. Continue with this leaf and float on the other side. Remember, some of this, if we get it on the black, we can just um, cut out around it or re-black up to it. Okay, let's leave that where that's at right now. We'll deepen here next to our leaf. This is not too lonely looking. And take what color do we have here? Georgia clay. I'm gonna do the dry rub with it. Bring that in. So we want to alternate these leaves. We don't want all brown ones next to each other and all red ones on top of each other. We have some alternating colors. And we're going to diffuse it out. If we're going to travel a great deal with this redder color, which is actually Georgia clay, we don't want it very dark everywhere. We want it more in spots. I'm running out of paper towel. This uh, dry rub technique is really paper towel intensive. Here's all my yellow, and then I have no room for my orange. But you can flip them in and out and reverse them and stuff like that. And since it's dry paint mostly, it works pretty good. So see how I'm taking it from these tips? No, oh, you can't see anything. But if we show you what we're doing. Okay, so see how I'm taking it from these tips and bringing it in without bringing it all the way up. It doesn't have to be the same on every tip. Maybe we want to leave that a little less and then bring maybe a little bit of red up into here. 
deep in that. It doesn't have to be the same amount on each one. Okay, then we can deepen what we've done. Okay, time to change that paper towel. Put them in there. Rub it up, up. Okay, now that's a little bit brighter leaf. Okay, and so then, probably gonna need to float and do some things like that. Really walk a little bit of a line here with these um, these dry rub brushes, leaving them wet. You don't want the paint to get hard. But I did find a truly exceptional brush cleaner. Um, that is a Windsor Newton product, and it's on the website. It will take crusty, crusty, crusty hard paint out of brush brushes. So you know, if we leave that paint in there a little long, we can always go out get it out of that brush. Okay. So we might need to walk that into that area right there. Don't want to leave any lines. And we don't want that leaf to become way weird from that leaf either. Or either. You say either, I say either. I can't see. So we're just kind of kissing the edges of these leaves with these colors. Maybe we need to bring a little bit in here. It's kind of, um, when you're doing this, use your pictures. So you can kind of look and see, because there's way too many leaves and way too many nooks and crannies to really tell. Okay, it's the left edge of the bottom leaf on the right side to the... Okay, let me take, we need to do a liner brush. We're going to go back to the russet for that. So that's 80% water. Start up here at the top and we're going to have it flow. Like I said, if you can do this all in one fell swoop, it's really a good idea. Maybe a couple extras. And I think we might even could go back up here and deepen that, or that thicken it. Taper it down. Nice. Okay, I'm liking that. Now whether or not we want to add a little bit of cadmium red, you know, I'm really thinking we don't. I'm thinking I think that's red enough. We'll see what that looks like. Hmm. Okay, so that being the case, then this one's probably going to have to be brown. So we're going to repeat the brown steps um, on this leaf right here. Same as we did over here. It's just really a reversed image. Okay, and we'll just go in and dry rub. Decide where we want it. Probably walk it out to this tip out here. And so the more you want it to fade off, the lighter your pressure is. Okay, we'll fill that in under there. Floats. Okay, I need to deepen it a little bit more.
So as you go through, you're going to have brown leaves and the red leaves, and I'm going to start us, um, repeat us a little bit and see if, um, if there's something that I need you to see that's different, I'll stop it. Okay, well I figured out at least one thing. I'm going to go back here. This is going to be behind. Whoops, let's get you on the camera. This one back here is going to be way behind and back in the back of things, so this one's definitely got to be a brown leaf. So a lot of times, somebody really smart once told me to start with what you know. So if we have a decision to make, then let's start with the one thing that we do know, which is this is behind and in back of, and then we can move forward from what we do know. And we'll have to bring this. Left over leaf over there. straight, right? Because we want these. And come in and deepen it up. Ooh, that's some heavy floating right there. decided on this one for this one above the brown one for the orange. I'm going to build this in deeper and I think this is going to need to be browner down here. So I'm going to keep some brighter highlights on the tips out here. And then I think I'm going to dirty brush into this russet color. And then we'll go in here and we'll deepen this. We could also go in and shade it deeper. Maybe just a little bit darkery looking. Darkery? Hickory, dickory, darkery. Okay. I'm done. Deepen that. And then. Let's go ahead. And float in here to deepen that. Okay, when that dries we can go back and we don't want this to be real outlining though, so we have to kind of graduate those floats out a little bit. Use our fingers to blot. I'm going to keep this relief a little bit brighter. Okay, just going to fade that in. Okay, then we go over to this other side and deepen that. If you like to play floating, this is a good project for you. If you don't like to play floating, I'm sorry. Try giving it just a little hint of black plum where things are going to get the darkest. Don't want that real liney or real stripey. Right along here. This one's a little more liney because we're deepening just where it just gets darker. Okay, we'll probably want to come along here and deepen that. Okay, how are we liking that? Okay, you can see that, I guess. Okay, and then whoop, down here.
We're going to switch to Patty's favorite dry brush. It can be wet. We're going to load, brush it into our brush. We don't want it wet, wet. I got water sitting. A little bit of russet, touch of honey brown, brush mix it, flick on our paper towel, and then we're going to flick on the highlights. We're going to leave space in the section so that it, what we basically did was face coated it with our shade color. Now I want this to twist, so I'm going to come up here and I'm going to have it go off the edge like it's wrapping around so that it might come back out over here. <coughs> Pardon me. Flick on the paper towel. Okay, so that's that one. And this is going to kind of follow and it's going to go off the edge over here. And this one will continue more. Okay, and then somehow or another, these poor little guys, Let's see if I can get this. It goes around, comes back out over here. And I'm assuming they're not going to follow any kind of natural gnarl that I think that they should follow. So keep building your colors. Okay, this is a nice twisty one. And then just keep picking up the same two colors. Now we're going to go into mostly the honey brown. And so to get this highlight on the center of this um, area and not going to be as bright as. Um, okay, now we we'll just carefully build highlights in the middle of the highlights that we already put. Okay, so I'll go up there. And we'll get this strengthened up. Okay. Now I think it would be lumpy as it went around and gnarled, so I'm going to take care of that in just a second. I don't want it to look like a candy cane when I get all done here. A little twist to it. That's nice. Back into honey brown. Um, I'm thinking we want this one to come out over here, kind of like it's twisting. Maybe we'll join that one with this one. I'm liking that. Get that twisted over. Okay, now honey brown, strengthening this middle one. Not too stripey. You'd be amazed at how many stripes all the way down. I'm going to give that a little lump up here where it's kind of going over the edge. Do the same thing over here. Like that lump is disappearing, so we'll highlight towards where that's leaving. And got it lumpy. Okay, so we'll come down here and like squinting and slouching and okay, this one's gonna gnarl and do stuff over here. We need a gnarl to come up underneath, I think. Ooh, how about a base coat? Okay, that's not cool. However, it'll probably be a happy little accident. Let's give this just a little bit of a gnarl up. And then that can go away like that. It's coming out and around. Okay, so now I think well, let's bring these. This one goes into this one. And these, I want to say they're a little bit lumpier. And they gnarl. So I'm just putting a little, not so smooth, it's, it's a little bit smoothy smooth over here. 
Okay, so then this one, same thing. Let's make it gnarl as it comes in and gnarl as it goes out. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I don't like these gnarls in here, so I'm gonna wipe them down. And watch this. We can go back into our russet. Just tickle those right on down. So now I got rid of those. Make those decisions so when you get when you're painting, you can just decide where you want them. stand up and take a look at where we're at. This one is really close to what we've got going on over here. So we're going to make somebody be the boss. So I'm thinking now this is going to come out and around. Okay, make those two meet. Alrighty. So we're going to use our, do we want to go up in value, hmm, let's go into yellow oxide with our dry brush here, keep the chisel on it, mine is getting a little wore out, and let's give a couple of these main sections a little extra oomph. you could see what I was doing, you could appreciate it. A little just oomphy. Not too bright. I'm going to drag that in. I'm gonna, if you have just spots of bright, then it'll read it as just spots. Okay, my brush is not cooperating. So I need to get into the smaller one. And I'll get a little more control. Now I can clean up. I've got a little fuzzies going on here. I can clean that up with my black. leave that alone for right now. See what we get. Let's go ahead and tint this R in here with a little bit of that pink as well. Give this a little bit of a tint down here as well. Go into our yellow and beef everything up just a little bit with yellow. in the buildings. We're in the middle of the R. We're going to go ahead and give the corners just a little. Where are we? Let's go ahead and give the corners just a little tickle of this color as well.
And then we'll go ahead and scatter. And let's try and get it in the corners. Turn your piece if you need to get a different angle on those spatters. And turn all the, do all the sides. Be careful, there's spatters on your table now, and that means that you'll have, um, you'll pick up spatters on your piece, and you don't want to smear things, so you might want to make sure to dry before you flip things around. Okay, so like, I wouldn't want to flip it on this side, because now there's wet spatters down there. So I can work on the inside while I'm doing that. Okay, and on this center area, maybe we'll spatter with a little bit of that bleached sand. Okay, now I'm taking Naflo Red in a kind of a wash, and I'm going to add, I'm going to add it to share the red love here. Not everywhere. Keeping it more like in the shadow area, and just kind of faint, and get that apple just a little bit redder. None of this on our pear. And maybe we can go in on the other side of our little berries and red them up just a little more with a real strong, just the ones in the middle where they need some attention. Put a little bit of this in our leaf. Put a little bit on either side of our pineapple. And I think maybe we'll go ahead with a little bit in this border right here. Bring that out. The chisel edge of our brush. Okay. A little bit more down here in the apple. See what we're doing? We're just really just working on balance. I'm just going to bring some blue into this piece, but I'm thinking I'm not going to. Okay, at the bottom of my letters, just a little bit in that dark area. Just to carry the eye around. keep from having any um, stop and start marks when you're washing. You have to keep moving the paint and you have to get it all on there while it's still wet. OK, 
Okay, and if you get any kind of real choppy things, you can mop it with a little mop or your finger or something. Let's see how down here it's got these little stop and start marks. Okay, so that's kind of stuck there, but what I'm going to do, because I've got this model background and we're doing this thing with washes, I'm going to go ahead and leave that, and when I shade and put my details in, it'll look like a dappled leaf. So we'll telephoto in. Oops. The right way. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there are some of these, these dots here that are huge, and that's because they have a lot of water. If we spatter, let's go wider. I'm going to show you how to use the, um, the, what is this brush called? You know, I have the hardest time with this. This was, is a filbert rake. Okay, I'm going to fill it with watery paint. Same as everything else. Always tap, always tap off on your palette. Okay, now this is going to be a little bit, I'll do the snow technique first. Okay, this one's going to be a little bit drier. And so you'll notice everything is a little bit tighter. Now I'm going to go a little bit wetter, and you'll see that the spatters are bigger. Okay. Now if I want to control, okay, I'm going to use a pencil. Say I want to spatter at the edge of my apple or whatever, and I want to spatter like right here, without snowing all over everything. You anchor your big fat brush. You lean it way down. And then you just tap, you always tap off here, just tap gently, smartly, pointing it where you want it. And now instead of spatters everywhere, I have spatters in a very controlled spot. This is an amazing technique. So if I want it to spatter in a little bit bigger, I would raise up where I was. And it's still very tight, very controlled. If I want it tighten down to the ground, my spattering movement is littler. So the size of spatters. When I just showed you how to use the toothbrush, the toothbrush had a lot of water in it. Okay, so we'll telephoto in. 